Here we are, Truth Baptist Church. Thanks for coming out. I want to begin uh, this Sunday School lesson in Isaiah. Just a quick little topic here, I think, that will lead to the rest of it. But I want to draw your attention once again to Isaiah 3 and verse 9. I read it a lot. It says, The show of their countenance doth witness against them, and they declare their sin as Sodom. They hide it not. Woe unto their soul, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. Isaiah 3 shows a declined nation, a declining nation, where toward the very end of their descent, immorality is a time when they declare their sin as a good thing, when they celebrate their sin, when they parade their sin. They declare their sin as Sodom, they hide it not. A sign of the times that we are in the end times is that sin is not only abounding, sin is celebrated. This week in the Lewis Clark Valley, where we reside, in fact, just yesterday, I guess, there was the, the annual event, which is Celebrate Love in the park right over here down the way. Celebrate Love in the park. I believe we are in a free nation. Everyone's allowed to assemble however they want. It's their God-given right. It's, it's the national right to assemble freely and to have free speech. But it is also the church's right to have free speech and also the church's job to still say sin is sin and uh, right is right and wrong is wrong. In fact, as we preach this morning, as we teach this morning, I believe me, what I'm about to say is exactly uh, one of the reasons why God put us here at this location, at this time and place, is to give the counterpoint to the idea of celebrate love in the park in the LC Valley, which absolutely is not a celebrate love event, it's a celebrate sin event. Look over at Isaiah chapter 5, please. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20. It says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. That's exactly what's happening right now. The evil that you see in those pride events is called good, something to celebrate. Meanwhile, what we do on Sunday mornings where we share the Word of God, we share the Gospel of Jesus Christ, we teach young children the Scriptures, it's seen as an evil activity. The world is upside down, even in this wonderful America. That put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Absolutely, that's what that event is doing. It is brainwashing our youth that those paths are good paths that lead to happy outcomes when we know that sin is never a good path. Sin never leads to a happy outcome. They put light for darkness, put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. It behooves us to ask, as they celebrate love, what is love? They hide behind this generic term, celebrate love, 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 in this generic sense of the word. So you'd think everybody can get behind this event. And if you look at that event and its sponsors, many do get behind this event. Churches get behind this event. Uh, private school got behind the event. Idaho Public Health got behind the event. That's your and my taxpayer dollars going to celebrate, going to sponsor that event. That means we're paying for that dogma, that doctrine to take place at the park. But it's all couched and hidden under this generic sense of love, celebrate love. Well, we as Christians have a real definite understanding of love, whereas the world has a very ambiguous understanding of love. I would even ask them, the event organizers, what love do they mean? Are we celebrating the love that is pedophilia? Is that the love we're celebrating? We might want to define it a little bit more narrowly. They would say, no, we're not doing that. Well, I don't know by your title. Are we celebrating the love that is bestiality? What love are we celebrating? We know some of the love is um, transgenderism, which is something that's completely unbiblical. Jesus Christ said in the beginning he made male and female. There are no other genders, and you cannot switch back and forth and thumb your nose at God's face. It's just a perverted decision, unnatural decision. Celebrate love, the meaning sodomy, homosexuality. We know Romans 1 tells us that men with men is called unseemly. It's even called vile. That word the world is shuddering about is still in scriptures calls that activity vile. So, but we are to celebrate that? And my tax dollars are supposed to go toward promoting that when it's completely contrary to my faith and the faith upon which our nation was founded? We are, we are out of place today. 
I may push forward on this topic about Idaho Public Health sponsoring that event. Whatever happened to good old separation of church and state? Does it go both ways? My taxpayer dollars shouldn't be going to push that agenda, should it? Should yours? Did you pay for that? Is that what you signed up for as a citizen in the state of Idaho to push doctrine and brainwashing that's contrary to the scriptures? These things are why God sets up churches to still say these things. Or darkness will cover the land completely. And the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ will be smothered in this sin and celebration of it. Look at 1 John chapter 2, please. And then we will get to my real notes for this morning. But it ties right to the lesson. As, I'm, as we look at churches and why churches are started... What I'm saying right now is, I think, a small part, or not a small part, a major part, of why God starts churches and why God started our church. To simply give an answer to the world. To push back. If you look at 1 John chapter 2 and verse 5, I'll show you why Christians have a good understanding of what love is, because the Scriptures, the Holy Scriptures, teach us what true love is. 1 John 2, 5, But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby we know that we are in him. We understand what true love is. The Bible says, And this is love that we keep his commandments. Love is obeying God's word. The most loving life you can live is a life that's in accordance with God's holy scripture. Why? Because God is love. God is love. And if you live like God, you're living a loving life. You want to live an unloving life? Disobey scripture. Disobey scripture as they promote in the park just this last week. Don't celebrate sin. The idea of celebrating sin is why God starts up little churches just like ours. And with that, I'd like to begin our topic this morning. And forgive me if it sounds self-serving or, or braggadocious. I don't mean it that way. But I want to praise the Lord for the door of utterance that He's opened here at 8th and 8th. We just yesterday, we wrote out our final check, our final check to pay off the building. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We had 15 years to pay off the building. And our church, through God's power and grace, helped us pay it off in three years. Praise the Lord. Look at Colossians chapter 4, please. Colossians chapter 4. And verse 2. Colossians 4, 2. 4.2 says, continue in prayer, Colossians 4.2, and watch in the same with thanksgiving. Our church wants to continue as a prayerful church and as a church that gives thanks. And I do that this morning. I give thanks for simply the opportunity to proclaim His Word. Look at verse 3. With all praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds. Praise the Lord for this door of utterance He has given us at 8th and 8th. It truly came out of nowhere. It truly fell into our laps. And here we have it. And if we don't utter the things like we just uttered at the start of this lesson, then we are missing our calling. Because truly, the calling of the church is to preach on the sin of the day. It truly is. Back in the nation of Israel, the prophets would rise up and you'd see them rail against different idolatry and Baal worship, etc., etc. Preach against the sin of the day. That's what churches are called to do. We try to do that here as God leads, preach against the idolatry that is adultery, the idolatry that is sodomy. That's why God built this church. It says in Revelation 3.8, let me read it for you. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. The church in Revelation 3.8, God opened a door for him, and he said no man can shut it. And why did he open the door? He was very clear. He says, thou hast a little strength. And hath kept my word. That's what God's looking for. Christians who will keep his word. For Christians who will keep God's word, he will open doors. For Christians who hide God's word, he will keep doors closed. 
And you will live a life on your path, not walking through the door that God has available for you if you simply keep His Word. That's not denied His name. So, how did this church begin? And this will tie into our lesson as we look at Baptists and how Baptists operate today. My thought for you is that, would you all agree, we need many churches that are keeping God's Word today. Agreed? We need churches in every town, every city across the nation, and probably multiple churches in cities, right? Big cities, you need a lot of good churches to cover all the neighborhoods. We need a lot more churches than we see today. It's really true. And I believe in small local churches. Like you get a big city, a big metropolitan area, you better have strong churches all over where you have pastors that know the people and people that know the pastor in a tight-knit group. Okay? That's, I believe, what God's model is. That's what we see in Scripture. We need more churches. So how did this church start? This one right here, this little one right here on 8th and 8th. Well, I want to tell you the story of how this church started. My wife and I, Felt called, right? Go out and start a church. So we went on deputation for three and a half years, raising funds. And we got fully, we were 80%, 90%, 95% funded. And then with 96%, we decided to step out by faith and just go for it. We need a building, though, so we quickly started emailing all around the nation. We need a building for this work. We got 96%. We'll step out by faith. Can you pony up the dough, all you other churches, and get us a building? We need a big building, something good. Got us a building. I'm now full-time, and I spend all week long, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, just polishing up my sermon. I've got every day, all day long to hone in this sermon, add in all kinds of little tricks and stories, and then deliver it. Wow. Of course, you know I'm joking, right? If we had done it, the usual, what, I'm, what I'm citing there is the average Baptist model today. Go around, travel around the country, and garner up support. And when you get all this full-time support, then you go start a church. Oh, my Lord, I hate it. I hate it. I get so many emails now from missionaries from the East who are going to be missionaries to the West. And they tell me, we're at 70%, we're at 80%, yet we're going to start a church in Montana, in Oregon, in Idaho. We just need you to support us. They want me to support them. And I just had a church from Montana the other day. The guy was um, bemoaning the fact, and I never met him before, but he emailed out of nowhere, looking for support, bemoaning the fact that he went out fully supported, meaning he sits on the couch during the week, fully supported, but now he's back, he's lost some support, back to about 70%. And on top of that, his church needs a new roof. I almost had a conniption fit. Get off your butt, get off the couch, and go get a job over there in Montana. There are jobs in Montana to be had. In our roof, we need a new roof. I don't go around sending letters across the America asking for a new roof. We're going to work. The local church is going to do God's work. That's how God intends it. Be a tent maker like Paul. We're going to see those scriptures today. Churches would start so much faster. I meet all these young men just out of Bible college. I don't meet them. I see them on email lots of times because they're looking for money. They email, they, they want some funding. And they're young people in the strength of their life, sitting around in an RV, driving around the country, trying to garner support when they could just be making a tent at some local location and building a church. Please look at Colossians chapter 4 and verse 12. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that ye may stand perfect to complete in all the will of God. For I bear him record that he hath the great zeal for you and them that are in Laodicea and them in Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Luke is a beloved physician because he's still working as a beloved physician. He's still working as a secular job, by the way. 15. Salute the brethren which are... In Laodicea, in Emphas, in the church which is in his house. There's a church here inside someone's house. You see that idea in multiple places in scriptures. You go out to a location, you start a local church in an unassuming little location like a house. 
So I'll tell you how Truth Baptist Church really started. And again, I'm just, I'm not trying to, to put us on a pedestal. I'm trying to say more churches could start this way. And you could see more churches in Arizona, in Oregon, and wherever in Montana start this way. And by the way, the Western mind, if you're trying to really reach the West, right? Missionaries to the West, missionaries to the West. You want to reach the West? Come out and show them that you're not a lazy bum sitting on a couch. Your voice will carry a little bit more. The West does like people who work. So when you got some lazy preacher fully funded come out and start a church, it just doesn't ring very well. Oh, by the way, I should do a disclaimer. I don't mind people going on deputation. I don't. I don't mind people raising funds, especially if you're going to a location that you need funds. Like if, we, if my family was going to go to the jungle of Africa where I'm not going to be able to scratch out a living and I don't know how to survive over there, I might go around saying, hey, I'm going to need some funding for this, mission, this missionary work, okay? That makes sense to me. Wherever, some place or some foreign field where you don't know it's uncertain how you're going to be able to make a living for you and your family, I get it. Raise some support, pray about it, and step out by faith still. But if you're in America where there's a job on every corner, right? Make a tent. Make a tent. And start a church in a house. Start a church small. It doesn't need to be a huge building. We held our first 74 services at Truth Baptist Church. Our first 74, I counted them, were in a garage at my house. We called it the shop church. We had been biblically sent out. Don't get me wrong. Don't start, start a church out of nowhere. The biblical model is people should be sent out from an existing church, right? Ordained from an existing church and sent out biblically. We did that. And God must have been desperately... Um, desperate for workers because he called Brett and I to go out and start a church. But the shop church where we had 74 services was wonderful, wonderful memories. I remember driving to Spokane right before it started and buying a bunch of chairs, nice church chairs. Bought about 40 church chairs and came back and I was so excited. We filled that shop church with about 27 seats. We could fit 27 there. And by the way, we never packed at the place. It was never maxed out. We had cold cold winters there, lonely winters sitting on that property in that shop. No visitors. We had hot, hot, hot summers there in that little shop, but it was wonderful. We bought a little air conditioning unit, and we called him Mr. Penguino. We added him to our attendance chart. He was there. He was active. He was engaged with the process. People got saved in that building. Kids got saved in that building. Adults got saved in that building. Kids and adults got baptized in that building. It was wonderful. And I'm not saying it to say that we are the, the, the end-all, be-all, but it's something that should be happening more often. Young people feel a call in their life, or whatever age, and they step out by faith and go start something small. God's into small things. Today, you, you get fully funded, you get a huge building, and you waltz in full-time, and then you call that stepping out by faith. Look at 4.17. And say to Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. Fulfilling your ministry. You know, as I look back at that shop church... I have no sense of embarrassment at all. And during the time, I had no sense of embarrassment. But I had friends and family who were absolutely embarrassed at what we were doing at our property. About the time we put a cross up on our garage, people did not want to be related to us anymore. Even my, my close friends and family. All right, my sending church, God love them, but I don't think we had hardly anybody come by that church ever. It was too much of an embarrassment. We were not embarrassed about being there. Why? Because we were simply fulfilling our calling. Looking back now, I kind of think, whoa, we did that? It felt like nothing. When God's in it, it feels exactly right. It felt exactly right. Please look at Acts chapter 13. Acts 13. Let's look at the biblical model as I challenge some of what I see happen with Baptist churches today. It's not just Baptists. All kinds of denominations have this two, three-year deputation model, fully funded model, even if you're just going to Boise. But I'm picking on Baptists because that's what we are. 
Look at Acts chapter 13, verse 1. Let's see the biblical model. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manaim, which had been brought up with hair of the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said... Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. Praise the Lord. Barnabas and Saul are called to go out, do God's work. They're going to start churches. Praise the Lord. Three, when they had fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away to Bible college. Barnabas and Saul, they go, Paul will be, they go off to Bible college. They spend four years getting a Bible degree in theology. Paul minors in music. He has a little music minor. And he's fully equipped then by man's teaching to go off and minister. Bible college. Is it even biblical, this whole idea of going off to Bible college? I don't mind learning. I don't mind studying scriptures. But you go off to Bible college. You leave your pastor. You leave your home church. You leave your ministry there. And you go off. You're taught by other people who you are laying hands on. You don't even know if they're saved or not saved. Who's right? Who's wrong in there? You hear all kinds of different uh, opinions about all kinds of things. Many young Christians who go to Bible college, they leave Bible college way more confused than when they entered in. They get away from just studying the plain reading of God's word and they hear all these different interpretations and they end up being confused and some of them completely forget about their callings altogether. I have serious questions about the whole Bible college model as it is. The training of the local church of God's word is sufficient for you to carry on and share God's word. No, they did not go off to Bible college. They went straight off. So they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed into Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. Now they went to Seleucia to garner support. They went to Cyprus to get that other 20% of the funding that they will need for their journey. Amen? And they were at Salamis asking for a handout. Right? This is what you see in Scripture, this model of bankrolling God's work. Bankrolling Baptist is what we want to call this idea. Forget about the George Mueller's and stepping out by faith. For Baptists to start churches today, it's a process. You better be fully funded and locked in and then throw that magic word faith. We're going to step out by faith. No, you're not. You've got all your bills paid for the next 10 years. Do any of us have that kind of plan in place? No. Oh, Lord, call me to be a missionary because that looks like a good gig. A missionary to Lewiston. How about that? Exotic Lewiston. I'm telling you, somewhere we've missed the mark on missions. And a lot of little churches should be started today, but they're not. Where's the building? They just go out and start preaching. Look at 5. When they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had also John to their minister. They just go out and start preaching God's word. Really simple. Please look at Acts chapter 18. Acts 18. This is not a lesson to toot any horn. It truly, I believe, my, in, in my heart, God is wanting me to somehow compel people, maybe through who watches things online, or to step out by faith truly and start more Bible-believing churches. Look at Acts 18, verse 1. Some of this reason we need more churches because of what happens in the park. Some of this reason we need more churches because I have many people reach out across the nation telling me they can't find a good church. And I'll get online and I'll try to do a search for them and find a decent church. And many times I completely strike out. Completely strike out. I'm not saying they're not out there. I just can't find them for many people. Look at Acts 18, 1. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy, with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, that's Paul, he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. Now, what do you mean Paul the Apostle's occupation, his craft, is tent making? Paul the Apostle is a called missionary, a preacher, an evangelist. He's a tent maker. You know how Paul gets to as many places as he gets to and is used as powerfully 
because he stepped out by faith. He combined faith with this idea that you can still make tents. You know, tent making took away from Paul's prep time, sermon prep time, didn't it? We don't need worldly prep time. God can supply sermons. God just wants men and women to step out by faith and do His work without having everything paid for, everything planned out, seeing everything through. So I was ordained on October 1st, 2017. We had our first Sunday service at Truth Baptist Church the following Sunday, October 8th, 2017. I've always worked a full-time secular job, and so has our deacon. I didn't take a, a cent for salary. Today we were doing the books because we're having a business meeting today. But um, of the expenses that we have, 4% of the, our church's expenses go towards pastor uh, housing allowance. 4%. I'm, not, I'm just saying this is a model that allows the church to start. Try starting a church when you pay a pastor full time. Try that. Try building a building when you pay a pastor full time. There are many churches today that are struggling financially, like the one in Montana. You know why? Because they're trying to pay the pastor full time. When he could just go get a job, make some tents, like Paul did. In preaching, I, it's like look down on, are you full time or not? Are you a full time preacher or not? Oh, you're not full time. Oh, you're, what do they call it? Bivocational. Okay. Well, the greatest missionary, the, probably the greatest preacher in the New Testament here, after Christ, Paul the Apostle, he's bivocational because he did not care about saving his life or finding his life. He cared about the Word of God going out. God used him in a mighty way. Some of what I'm getting at is if we had done this experiment, God's experiment, God's work here at Truth Baptist Church, the, the Baptist model way, it would not exist today wouldn't be here. Some people wouldn't be saved unless the Lord reached them in some other way. Please look at Acts chapter 20. Acts 20, 17. If some of my language is off-putting, I apologize, but I want to show you some of Paul's language, which can also be off-putting if you think that he's just bragging about himself. Look at Acts 20 and verse 17. And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. The elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, You know from the first day I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with tears and temptations which befell me by the line and way to the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks repentance toward God and faith toward Jesus Christ. Paul went out with a sense of urgency in his, in his missionary work, an urgency that people needed to repent. That's a good phrase there. Read that. Look at that. Repentance toward God and faith toward Jesus Christ. Is repentance still required for our age? Absolutely. Repentance is no sort of act of penance. It's no act of works at all. But repentance toward God means you, you admit to God that this is wrong. I've been living wrong. I am in trouble. I know I am a sinner now very clearly. I can see the sins in front of my face. And then after that repentance, what do you do? You put your faith in Jesus Christ. Repentance, faith. You say, are you saved by repentance? You're saved by faith? They're part of the same thought. Because once you finally change your mind about who you are, you will look desperately for the answer to find out who Jesus is. He is the answer. Faith toward Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit into Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. The Word of God is going out, praise the Lord, through the work of Paul. 
But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel, the grace of God. Good verse there, isn't it? Workers used of God, called of God, who serve God well are those who do not count their lives dear. Right? Those who count their lives dear are the ones waiting for that 97% support. Not stepping out by faith. Finishing their course. Brother Brett had a good sermon the other night mentioning finishing the race and the relay race, didn't he? Thought it was a good sermon. And now behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. When Paul went off to a location to preach, he viewed the responsibility as God-given and God-demanded and as if he, the blood of people's souls was going to be on his hands if he didn't deliver the truth to them. And not just the, the truth of Jesus Christ, but the full counsel of God. That includes sins. That includes sins like what we see in the park across the way. The full counsel of God. He did not shun to declare it. That's how we should approach God's work around the nation in Montana. Preach the full counsel of God, right? Give people no excuse. In Lewiston, preach the full counsel of God. Friends, we're here today, and I know I mentioned things that predate some of your interaction with Truth Baptist Church, but I'm trying to simply remind us that God sets up churches, and He set up one here. And it's a very straightforward charge to preach the full counsel of God here on 8th and 8th. Why? Because across the way, they're calling good evil and evil good. And if we let that song play out across the nation, pretty soon everyone will think that evil is good and that good is evil. And then you have wholly lost your nation. You've, you've created a complete nation of darkness for our kids to grow up in. And I don't want them to grow up in that yet. Do you? I want them to at least look around and, and not feel like they are the dodo birds, the only ones who th still think that sin is sin. I want them to find somebody else who says, oh yeah, God's word's true. You're right. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. The Holy Ghost calls. The church confirms and sends out preachers to start churches. It's a work of God, which is why I marvel at preachers called across the nation and Baptist preachers called. No doubt they are called. I don't doubt that. I believe God is calling many people to preach. Maybe not from behind a pulpit, but many people to preach. But we take God's calling, and then we add on this whole Jethro layer of, well, we've got to get everything in order before we do this. We need more preachers who are not educated so much in schooling, but educated in God's Word, right? Not so much intelligent, but wise in the Scriptures. That's all we need. We are building right now, Bible College is starting right here, right here, right there with our children. Bible College has started. We're teaching the kids the Word of God. They're being equipped for ministry. Praise the Lord. You didn't know that this was a Bible College, did you? It is. And we can ordain right here. And from right here, we can send out a Paul and a Barnabas and their spouses. To feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Yep. For I know this, that after, 29, after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Paul says, okay, you got this, these churches started. That's great. There's going to come new preachers, new teachers, who are going to be speaking perverse things and drawing disciples. So Paul says, remember how I did church work, okay? Night and day with tears, 
watching, right, for souls. Now 32, and now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Paul's big testimony here is, you know I was never about the money in your church. I was never about money. Does our world get that message today with this model of Baptist ministries? Right? We'll go out in the world, going to preach, and I've got a full-time salary, and I need you to show up and put some money in the box to keep my family afloat. It just looks like we covet the world's money. He says, 34, Yea, ye know yourselves that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. His hands have ministered. He's worked. He's had a job. I don't begrudge a church as it grows. You know, a church grows and you have this larger congregation. You need to devote yourself fully to it. And the church is well established. And it makes sense to support a pastor more. That is fine. But what I'm really preaching against is this idea of young ministers not making tents. And still wanting a full ride. It makes no sense to me. I have showed you all things how that's so laboring. You ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. How do we model that with our setup today? All right. We're going to go off into these communities, tell people to give to a church. Well, I'm going to sit home and not work, but you are going to work. It doesn't work well. What you have to resort to is ear tickling to build those things, right? You know, one big problem with this whole idea is that if a minister, right, right, young or whatever age, is owned by the people, he's more inclined to tickle ears to appease the people, right? You see that Paul, many times he'll say, with my own hands, I've, I've done this, and that allows me to preach at you, <laughs> To preach things, I'm not beholding to you. He's very honest. It, it, it turns him into this wonderful preacher. Other churches have to make merchandise of people to keep them around. And when he thus spoke, and he kneeled down and prayed with them all, and they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more, and they accompanied him unto the ship. This is beloved Paul. He walked by faith his whole life. His walk by faith ended up compelling him to make some tents along the way. As we close, if you can remember anything at all, I know you can, but if you care to remember anything at all from this, is that we need more churches. We need more churches. I want to raise from this church more preachers, and I want people to get behind the local church approach to things again. Not to send people off to Bible colleges where they waste their lives, waste their time, and some don't even end up preaching after that. And not to travel around this nation asking for handouts, but simply step out by faith. If we had that model, you'd see a lot more churches. Okay. Does this make sense to you all or not, or was I just on a tirade? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you help us to be truly people of faith. Lord, of, of people that put faith above finances. Mm, Lord, people who, Lord, are ready to step out and give an answer in this dark world and to tell the world what light still is, what love still is, what truth still is. Lord, help us to be those people in this little pocket of the world. And Lord, if we may impact others, we'll give you all the honor and glory and praise for it. Well, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, that can wash every sin away and can cleanse, Lord, everyone, no matter what their sin is. Christ can save their soul, and we thank you for that. Help us proclaim his name today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.